So we've heard a, a tremendous amount about One Health and infectious disease threats, and also about the opportunities. And that's really what I want to focus on today, because I think that that's the opportunities that get us towards solutions. So as indicated, I work at the, the World Bank, um, where our scope includes nearly 190 countries, both the wealthy countries uh, who are the donors and client countries who are the lower income countries. Our annual investment portfolio is, is about $60 billion across more than a dozen sectors, uh, and individual investments can easily reach into the hundreds of, hundreds of millions and span multiple countries. Uh, and so it's very important for us to balance the diverse needs and, and interests of many actors, both when implementing an individ individual investment or um, when developing a new knowledge area like, like One Health. So either way, it, it's, it's really critical for us to keep an eye on the, the knowledge and technical community, because this is really where the best practices and frontier innovations come from. Um, so we can ensure that our work is really is, is as good as it can be and is, is up to date. And so for that, I'm incredibly grateful to, to be here. So thank you very much. The conversations have been really very rich on infectious disease and One Health uh, and are entirely relevant to our programming. So what, uh, what is the World Bank? Well, we were initiated after World War II to help rebuild Europe. But over time, that mission has evolved. And now we're focused on the two goals of alleviating poverty and building shared prosperity. Um, we primarily do this by providing low interest loans and, and uh, interest free credits and grants. However, we also work by convening folks, uh, both public and private sector, so that we might crowd in experience and, and knowledge to deliver the kinds of results that we need for, for our countries. Um, we also generate knowledge, we write reports, we develop global goods agendas like climate change and, and, and One Health. Um, we provide direct technical assistance to countries, both rich and poor, to help them gain access to resources like the ones that we have here today in this room. But why do we even care about One Health? Well, for one, it aligns with international agendas. It underpins the Sustainable Development Goals, the universal UN-led call to protect people on the planet, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Uh, of the 17 goals, these six are directly aligned with the science and practice of One Health. They have to do with the biophysical processes um, and achieving success in any one of them really co requires coordination uh, amongst the others. Um, one Health provides the, the framework and the understanding, I think, to help the implementation process to really make this happen. And success in these other 11 is also contingent uh, upon One Health, uh, though it's more got to do with the socially mediated institutions. But those can really only operate effectively in the context of a healthy environment and in healthy people. So really, One Health underlies all of the, all of the SDGs. There's also been considerable action in the field over the past two decades, and we're really only building on what's been done. There are initiatives like the, the One Health Initiative and the One Health Commission, conferences that have been central in the coordination efforts. There have been volumes of analysis on, on One Health, uh, like topics on AMR and others, um, that, that bring sort of um, you know, a nuanced perspective to the One Health dialogue. Uh, there are also dedicated programs on various dimensions of One Health, like climate change and health, uh, which is my primary area of focus of the World Bank. Um, it has to do with making uh, policy decisions, indicator tracking, there's a civil society-led campaigns. Uh, and then, of course, there are many, many regional initiatives. Here are just a couple, um, but Dr. Bonefob had a tremendous list on, on his slide earlier today. One Health is, is also incredibly important to the regions that we work. So Dr. Dejak sh showed this slide yesterday, which illustrates where uh, emerging infectious disease events are caused by zoonotic pathogens from wildlife. When overlain with a uh, map of the World Bank regions where we work, you'll see that these geographies that have fit squarely in our, um, in our, in our regions. Um, Infectious disease and One Health are also fundamentally important to our business lines. So we're the leading global financer of agriculture in the world, with about $3 billion in uh, new investments in 2016. We've got about $7.5 billion worth of environment and natural resources projects, forest, fisheries, uh, air pollution, so on. Uh, the World Bank Group health portfolio is worth about $12 billion. And we have extensive and growing investments in, in climate change. Uh, both mitigation and adaptation uh, across sector, with more than $10 billion to 177 projects in 2016 alone, and about $60 billion in the past five years. So really, it just makes sense to work at the intersection of all of these, and I think that's what One Health is telling us.
Uh, but of course, infectious disease also poses considerable risks to achieving best outcomes. Now, we've seen these before, so I won't really talk about them. Um, but here are just some quick facts that illustrate how a One Health approach is, is critical to achieving our business lines. Infectious diseases undermine human health, they undermine animal health, uh, and they, of course, are only going to get worse in the future with climate change. If the tangible impacts weren't enough, uh, the financial ones should really drill this message home. Here's an illustration that we put together with our colleagues at EcoHealth Alliance. Where's Peter? Again, thank you, Peter. Um, that demonstrates some of the tremendous economic impact of infectious diseases over the past 15 years, where the size of the bubble represents the relative impact, and the icons indicate uh, the, the sector that the losses are primarily associated with. But it doesn't have to be like this. A recent analysis by some of our economic colleagues suggests that global, global implementation of One Health systems would cost anywhere from two to three and a half billion dollars a year. And this would include things like training, establishment of new One Health centers, development of better surveillance and early warning systems, and so on. Yet the average return would be almost $40 billion a year in terms of benefits from enriched environmental and health systems through tourism dollars, increased productivity following from better health, um, healthier and more valuable livestock, so on and, and so on and so on. So what are we doing and, and how are we trying to solve some of these problems? Well, this is more or less the accepted model for, for One Health that everyone is familiar with. And we're working within that, but, but we're not doing everything. Yesterday, in, in her talk on communication and social science, Dr. Lipinski mentioned that uh, One Health has somewhat of an amorphous definition. And our work is entirely consistent with that. We've had to mold the definition to fit within our institutional constraints. So fundamentally, we do have uh, um, investments that touch on every dimension of, of One Health, whether that be food safety and security, water and sanitation, nutrition, and, and, and so on. Um, but we've chosen to scope our global investment framework only on infectious disease. And this is because, one, there is demonstrated demand, interest from countries, um, as well as some of the folks that we're partnering with. But also, it makes sense within the current politics of the institution and the professional expertise that we have. And so part of this is just about working within the system to try to push this ball a bit further along, along the line, rather than doing everything for everyone. So I'll let you read this. Uh, this is our working yet definition of One Health. You can see that all the requisite parts are, are there to give us hooks to develop One Health in the future. There's prevention, preparation, detection, response, recovery, and all of these will help us engage with, with different groups uh, within the bank and with, a, with our partners. AMR has also been specially highlighted because it's not an infectious disease, but also because we believe that it really requires all the attention that we get, and so we need to be incorporating it into our policies to increase the level of awareness. What are we doing? Well, what we're doing this. Um, and this is a lot of words, and it's, it's effectively World Bank longhand for One Health. And we've written it out for a very specific reason. Um, and that's because we, we want to make sure that everyone gets this, right? So One Health may be well understood in this room, but that's certainly not true at a global financing institution. So we need to, again, make sure that we have explicit hooks there for environment, animal, and, and human health uh, to bring those folks into the room to have this conversation. Um, what is it and what will it do? Well, number one, it's, it's educational. It's a 200-page document. Um, some might say it's a tedious 200-page document, uh, but it's been socialized widely amongst WHO, OIE, CBD, ILRI, FAO, UNEP, others. Um, and the purpose is to, again, to sort of increase awareness, build partnership, and get folks on the same page about what we're doing. Number two, it lays out the approach to applying One Health in World Bank operations. Who is needed in the room? Uh, what are the best investment options? What are the economic and development investments uh, opportunities? And, and what types of projects are the best candidates for One Health investment? And three, it is political. Uh, it enables governments and countries who already have One Health perspectives and programs to approach our institution for funding and support. So this is, this is not a report, rather it is an operational framework, a blueprint for making investments within the institution. And that's a critical distinction because we're really trying to, to turn these One Health concepts and ideas into action through cash uh, and through programs on the ground. But what is in here? Well this, alright. So. 
this is, again, it's sort of a, a good representation of the, the tedium associated with this document that is necessary in bringing all the right pieces in. Um, but just look at the headings, capacity assessments, expert networks, implementation resources, and so on. So this document um, you know, provides a, a list of all the potential resources and lays out the framework for bringing country teams into the, into the action so they can incorporate these into their projects. But how, how will this work? Again, we don't expect this program to fix all the infectious diseases in all the countries. Rather, we hope that it will add another level, level of protection to, to work uh, in concert with other existing programs on infectious diseases. So this is just illustrative. It, it's not comprehensive. Um, and there are perhaps better examples of other ID programs. But I hope it provides some sense of the, the overall idea of, of what's going on with this. So essentially, every global program has something to offer, and each works to reduce specific disease threats within its, within its mandate. Um, the One Health framework that we've established does this as well by recommending interventions and providing tools to help further diminish these risks. Uh, it's, it's another filter, if you will, from infectious disease to population impact. And this means different things at different levels. For, for example, uh, at the global level, it has to do with the allocation of resources and convening of policymakers and experts. And at the country level, it has to do with disbursement of funds and the direct applications of some of the tools that were listed in the last slide. Uh, and in, in both instances, it enables solutions for folks who need to tackle infectious disease. Now, before I finish up, let me just provide you with two quick country examples so you can see how this might work in motion. So one, uh, the Regional Disease Surveillance Systems Enhancement Project, which is a new project that aims to strengthen disease surveillance in countries of the, the ECOWAS region, Economic Community of West African States. The project was launched after the Ebola crisis in 2016, uh, building on all of the associated uh, momentum, response, and recovery. And the idea here is to establish core country and regional capacities to build broad-based disease uh, surveillance systems and, and response mechanisms. It's also a partnership that's included uh, you know, folks from, from this room at Gates, WHO, CDC, OIE, and, and others. And I can tell you that it's a real One Health effort. Um, it involves you know, specialists across the spectrum, ecology, public health, ID, disasters, climate, um, to shape the lending package and ensure that these interventions uh, include things like intersectoral training, laboratories for rapid diagnoses of animal diseases and human diseases, cross-border containment, and, and so on. And over the next several years, the project should disperse at least $100 million to achieve these outcomes. Uh, and then next, this is, this is Madagascar. So I was just here on Friday and had spent the past couple of weeks there where we were conducting an environmental health analysis of the threats and opportunities in country and then linking that to, to World Bank investment so that we might make recommendations for interventions to, to address these. Um, now, for, forgive this slide, it's, it's in French, but this provides an overview of how this process worked. So first, we prepared a, a, a desk study, uh, pulling in all the documents that we could in Madagascar internationally that might have had some relevance, looking at environmental systems, health systems, infrastructure, agriculture, transport, uh, and where potential hooks might be. Then we went to the country, we consulted uh, in-country players, both in the government and the NGO community, uh, had workshops, meetings, um, and then we went on site visits, you know, visit places where this was in action, visit some clinics and some hospitals to, to get a sense of what was really needed. And then we spent several months writing this up with a team of international and, and local experts, and then went back to the country and had uh, a good long dialogue about what was actually potential. So, you know, it, it's, it's good for us to sort of have these ideas and make these recommendations, but it means nothing unless we ground truth them with people in the country. Um, and so we did that, and, and now where we are is that we've made these recommendations and we're actually integrating them into the World Bank Madagascar investment portfolio. Uh, so they've got projects in different areas. Many of these recommendations will go into environment and health projects, but we're actually making re recommendations uh, system-wide to, to address One Health. Uh, but then, of course, while we were there, there was this, um, the plague. So there have been, I think, latest numbers, around 350 people that have been infected, uh, 40 have died. Uh, plague has existed in Madagascar for a long time, but um, this, uh, this particular outbreak is unique in that it's being transmitted mnemonically. Um, and this is not sort of what's happened in the past, and so it's concerning because it's also happening in the capital city. Um, and as a result, the government is closing schools, restricted public gatherings, they're canceling some flights, uh, the WHO has released emergency funds, um, and the World Bank is trying to figure out how we can get involved either for now or for the long term as well. 
Um, and I think it underscores the, the point that we really need to be flexible as an institution and the international community to adjust our response when these instances come up. You know, emerging infectious disease events will continue to happen, and we really need to be optimally pre prepared and, and responsive. And though there are many ways to do this, I think that drawing upon uh, the tools that are included under the One Health umbrella is, is really a good start. So, thank you. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Yes, Peter. Cheers. Uh, thanks very much, Tim. <clears throat> um, how does the World Bank make decisions on projects like the Madagascar issue? Is this something that, that um, a group of experts in a room decide at World Bank, or, or does it come from the country? And, and if so, how do people in countries where they feel there's a need get to you and the decision makers of World Bank to help a project happen? Absolutely, that's, that's a great question. And you know, fundamentally, it's got to be a dialogue. I think that, that folks at the World Bank are, are typically more approachable than we might seem. You know, it's on button my jacket here and take off my tie. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we know that we don't have all the answers. We know that folks that are in the ground, on the ground in countries have been working with this and experience it day to day. And often it just takes a call to somebody working in a country office to say, all right, we have this particular expertise, we're seeing this threat, what can we do about this? And oftentimes, folks that are working in specific country offices, they aren't engaged in the way that everyone in the, th this room is. You know, someone who's a, a World Bank country manager may have expertise as an economist or a public health expert or uh, has a finance background. Um, and so they may not see the, the threat or, or the opportunity as clearly as we do. And so it just takes talking to them. And then from when that happens, there's a conversation that will take place within the country management unit amongst experts within the institution and then pulling in whoever else is there to understand what the, the potential opportunities are and if the World Bank can catalyze resources to address this threat or if it's something that falls outside of the scope of the expertise of that office and it needs to be um, allocated to someone else. Mm -hmm. More questions, comments? Yes, here. I'm from Madagascar. Ah, <laughs> oh, <great>. so, yes. <laughs> uh, my question is, how do you convince authorities there to get into this one? Because if you take up the question of plague, I have read in newspapers that the Minister of Health didn't acknowledge at all that you had plague in Madagascar, and there is nothing to worry about. Mm. But if you were there recently, you should have seen as well, or read, or learned that someone from Seychelles mm. who was there to collaborate with Madagascar in the sports area, he, uh, he died, or this, just three days after. And then, under pressure of international relations, only they decided then to change their mind. So how did you convince these people then? And having said that, we say that we lack authorities there. None of them is here, so I'm not scared to say also that we don't have the right competencies there at this high level there. So it's also something that should be addressed before you go and talk to such people because it might be a waste of resources. Mm. Mm. Excellent, yeah, so I think that the first point is that I, in some degree I sympathize with uh, the decision-making authorities in Madagascar uh, because they've got to balance responding to the, the disease outbreak and preventing sort of mass hysteria. You know, there are a lot of folks in the capital city that were wearing face masks and people were very concerned and you know, meetings were being shut down somewhat arbitrarily sometimes. Uh, and so the government has to balance those needs with an accurate and appropriate response. That being said, absolutely you know, hear your opinion on, on how the, the government could use increased capacity in understanding amongst these shared disease threats or these shared One Health risks or opportunities. Um, and I think, again, that's where the international community can help with the WHO and the World Bank and experts like yourself. So what we're doing is that we are advocating for the, the implementation of certain in interventions that help to increase government capacity and understanding. Um, so as we are providing these grants and loans in Madagascar, which total around a billion dollars, we're including uh, training and capacity building mechanisms to help get folks up to speed. We're bringing in experts that can work with other experts in Madagascar to help socialize these ideas um, and then ensure 
that they that the, the financing delivers the kinds of results that they were hoping for uh, to prevent these kinds of impacts in the future. Um, and then also, I think there's a real opportunity there for Madagascar to come out as a real exemplar um, in working at this interface. There's so much biodiversity in Madagascar, uh, and there's also so much poverty uh, and health impact. And so I think that by bridging these two things together, uh, Madagascar has a lot of potential for success, and I think that can also incentivize decision makers. And, and do you agree that it is hard to convince them? Um, I think it depends who you're talking to. I mean, there's some very smart, savvy folks that exist within the government, um, but they are subject to the same kinds of, of structures and hierarchies that, that we all are. Um, and sometimes that exists at the highest levels, and sometimes it doesn't. It's just about finding the right entry points uh, and ensuring this gets elevated in any way that we can, drawing upon our own individual and comparative advantages. So for myself, for example, working with the World Bank, you know, we can go directly to the, the ministry level or go to talk to the finance minister. And if that's another sort of entry point, a fulcrum, where we can lever this idea up, um, you know, that's what we'll do. Thank you very much, Timothy. Just